All right, I'm going to get started this morning. So thank you all for joining us. We had, as I mentioned, over 100 people who um, participated. I, I really wasn't sure what the response would be given how uh, hectic our school year has been. And um, I really, really appreciate everyone who's here today um, for coming together to learn about Next Steps or NRPS 2025, a strategy for the future. And so I'm going to talk through this morning a little bit about the purpose of today, our visioning process, what it looks like, a little bit of the history, the timeline. We then will get into the protocol itself, which I shared out with you yesterday, which is um, a visioning process for the future. I'll walk you through an example of what that could look like and how we're going to collect some of that information from all of you that would like to submit. And then at the end, there'll be opportunities for you to begin to work on this yourself. And you know, we've allotted a couple of hours here for this time. I'm going to be here, and we can work with you um, on that. But at the end, if you do need to, you know, once you have enough information and you have the tools to move forward, you can certainly um, work on this on your own as well. So I'll explain all that in greater detail as we move forward. So our goals for today is. You know, number one, to gather information and feedback from educators, staff, students, parents, guardians, families, and others in the school community, in addition to our administrative leadership team. And quite honestly, about a week or so ago, I was working on this, probably about three weeks ago now, I was working on this with my administrative leadership team, which is all of our principals, our district administrators. We have a retreat every summer. And we're meeting in late July and we're coming together as a leadership team and we're going to do this exact same process. And I've, I've actually got them doing this process now so that when we get to that leadership team, we've already done some of our visioning um, and we're able to jump right into the connecting the dots part, which is so the visioning being where do we want to be? Where are we now? And then connecting the dots between there. And as I was doing that, I started thinking that it really makes a lot of sense to hear from the parents, the families, the students, the staff, so that there's even more buy-in. And when we talk about having that investment in our strategy, you know, I really do believe that this strategy doesn't live on a shelf and it is something that we talk about in the budget process and it is something that we um, talk about in NRPS 16, 2016 or NRPS 2021. It's something that is talked about by others in the community, but I think this step will, will enhance that for everyone. So I really want that ownership and enactment throughout the system. And I think the first step of ownership is to see your own thoughts, voice, and opinions in there. So it's also a goal of mine, and I have got several administrators. I know um, Sean Colleen's on the call, Dr. O'Connell. I've seen um, a lot of our principals and district administrators are listening in either today or at tonight's session. We're going to record these and, and review the feedback as well. So we want to hear as much as we can from our community about um, this to help our team develop the plan. But just, you know, essentially what's going to play out is the administrative leadership team. And then we also are having a retreat this summer with our curriculum leaders who are all teacher leaders in August. So between those two um, events, we are going to have a much more um, detailed understanding of what the community would love to see for our visions. And it will help inform you know, the directions that we had. So we're going to follow the school reform initiative process called Back to the Future, steps one through six, and I'll explain that in great detail as we go on. Um, I will share a presentation and answer clarifying questions and probing questions, that's steps one through four, and then I'll provide an opportunity for those in attendance to complete a Google form, which would cover steps five and six, and then encourage you to complete additional submissions in the coming weeks. So just to be clear, this presentation is not an open forum to discuss current events and debate what should or should not be taught in schools. However, creating such a forum for the community could certainly be an action step because I think, you know, and I'll address this a little bit as we go on, um, it's not a, this is not a place to criticize or debate any viewpoints. I think there are, as we're aware, and we've seen what's been going back and forth in the transcript a little bit, there is some hot topics right now in, in curriculum that I think have really valid arguments on both sides that we need to hear and listen. Everyone is concerned, and in, in this I'm very confident, every parent or community member that reaches out is concerned with what's best for the kids. There's some disagreement about what that is, and I think as a community we need to continue to grow and address that 
question of how we can do what's best for kids and try to come to some consensus. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done because there's certainly some different um, viewpoints. But I think that the concept of having a forum, some training, some discussions can continue. But that's really not the purpose of this discussion. But hopefully that will come out through some of what you submit to us. And remember that today our audience contains many stakeholders and this includes NRPS students. So we have on this call today, we have administrators, we have teachers, we have parents, we have community members, and we have students, um, and, and, and also NRPS staff as well that may be involved today and have provided feedback. And I've really enjoyed the feedback that we've received. I will say already that some of the feedback that came in through the survey, there was a couple of instances where I read something about some, what someone wanted to see for 2025, and I said, that already should be in place right now, and there shouldn't be any question about that needing to be a five-year strategy. And, you know, I, one example, I walked down with Dr. O'Connell, and, and we talked about it, and we met with a student who shared some great feedback, and we made some changes right on the spot. So all of this information is very helpful, but please remember that our audience contains um, students as well. So I've referred to the Back to the Future protocol. I hope you had a chance to look it over. This is from the School Reform Initiative, which um, I think this, I think when we hired Dr. O'Connell, this was one of the things she talked about, how much she loved using protocols. So I think she's very excited um, to be uh, using this Back to the Future protocol. This is a program, um, a protocol that was shared with me. I'm a part of my training as a new superintendent is in a program called the, the superintendents, uh, the new superintendent's induction program. And they very much have guided us through this process of creating a strategy, understanding the difference between a strategy and a strategic plan, and going through a process to really imagine a vision for the district for the future. And as I'll explain in the history, I'm not the first superintendent to have done this and to follow this. I'm sort of third generation of this NISIP program and the strategy and action concept. But what we're going to do today with this Back to the Future protocol process begins with an overview, which I'm obviously doing now, and our presentation. We then will look at some clarifying and probing questions around our process. Then the exercise is to project into the future and describe in, in very colorful, figurative words what you would like to see in the future in 2025. Number Step five is we look back, describe where we are today, and that's as far as we'll go at this time. And then at our retreats with the administrative team, we will connect those dots, look at all these, you know, I will compile all of these vision ideas for the future. And we will, as an administrative leadership team, try to connect those dots to see what do we need to do in 2021, 22, 23, 24, in order to get where we want to be for 25. We'll also identify the challenge and debrief about next steps. And my idea would be to bring back not just a presentation, but this kind of interactive forum with the whole community to revisit steps six, seven, and eight with everyone. So to provide a little bit of history here, as I mentioned, I'm third generation here. So in 2011, Superintendent Kathleen Willis introduced strategy in action, and we developed the NRPS 2016 plan, which built upon previous district strategic plans, but certainly had a new idea and a new concept of developing a strategy. In 2015, Superintendent John Bernard led the administrative team to create NRPS 2021. And we felt that NRPS 2016 was really um, a strong plan. It was something that was we were well versed in. It was helping inform our budget and it was informing our decisions. And we really picked up and built on that plan and, and added to it to enhance it for the future. In 2020, when I, Superintendent Daly, came on, uh, we began the process of creating NRPS 2025. In the fall of 2019, I shared my entry process and the plans for developing NRPS 2025. And part of what I shared was that, you know, it had been now 10 years since we've done some of the initial steps and changed things and looked at, you know, do we have the right focus? Do we have the right big rocks, which I'll explain a little bit in a moment. And we started to think about maybe we needed to go back and revisit some of the things that have been in place for the last 10 years and see whether they still apply to where we want to be for the next five to 10 years. So in 2020-21, we've aligned our FY22 budget with the NRPS 2025 Big Rocks. 
Um, last summer, I'm sorry, we identified the big rocks. Our plan at the retreat last summer, obviously, was to do all this work. But with COVID, we were derailed a little bit. We still were able to meet and have some of these discussions about big picture, but there was so much to do with reopening and, and planning that some of this got pushed aside. Um, but we were able to identify big rocks. Those big rocks helped guide our budget process for this year. And we began to adjust and prepare the alignment of our school improvement plans um, to this process of what the NRPS 2025 looks like. So this June, what we're doing now with administrators and with all of you following this protocol and defining the strategic initiatives. And in this summer, at the retreat, we're going to use a rubric to review our strategy. We're going to see whether our strategy is still doing everything that it needs to do and where we can improve it. This is the administrative team's work. We're going to review all of these suggested vision for the future ideas and then connect those dots. We will then work to create goals and initiatives for each school year and create a draft of NRPS 2025 to, scare the, to share with the school community. And so the idea is those goals and initiatives that are in the, the district plan would then be reflected in the school plans, they would be reflected in department goals, and it would also be reflected in some of the educator goals so we can see that alignment. And obviously it all um, is also aligned with our school committee goals as well. So I would obviously be presenting this to the school committee and the school community, aligning it with those, uh, the budget with those identified goals, and again, all of this alignment with our goals across the district. And as a superintendent, one of my goals is to create this alignment across all the district's um, goals and plans. So a little bit about strategy and action. You're gonna hear us talk a lot about the instructional core. And no matter what we think about, no matter what we focus, we always wanna make sure that what we're talking about really deeply affects one, if not all three of these areas. So rigorous content, making sure that our curriculum is absolutely the most rigorous it can be in order to achieve the best goals for our students, making sure that we invest in our teachers and educators, that we have the best teachers teaching our students, and that our teachers are qualified and trained and prepared for what lies ahead and supporting them in every way, and also our focus on our students and our focus on all students that it's not just some students that have opportunities, it's that all of our students have opportunities. And equal access to courses, equal access to supports, equal access to extracurriculars, and making sure that all of the goals we talk about support students, teachers, and a rigorous content. So here's our NRPS vision statement. So our current vision statement was written and rewritten in 2011. And our vision statement is the North Reading Public Schools prepare all students to be productive citizens who thrive in the 21st century. And our current mission statement, the North Reading Public Schools provide a safe, supportive, and contemporary learning environment where dedication to excellence, service, and lifelong learning is paramount. All students are challenged to work collaboratively and to become creative and critical thinkers. Emphasis is placed on mastering core academic knowledge developing 21st century skills, pursuing individual potential, and fostering citizenship in a global society. So my question to everyone that I asked as a part of our program was, what do you think of these mission statements? What do you think of the vision statements? And are there any words or concepts or ideas that are somewhat um, that you would like to see in a mission or vision statement. And it's interesting, as I read this, I think back historically to what we were thinking about at the time. Obviously, safety and security is always first and foremost. We were in the middle of a building project. We had just finished one at the Batchelder School. We were working on different projects across the district. So that concept of a, you know, a, a, a learning environment that's contemporary was so in the forefront of our minds at that time. And the whole idea of you know, 21st century skills made a lot of sense you know we are now in our third decade of the of the 21st century and so it's it's interesting to think about what words you as a community would come up with that you'd love to see and so here's some of the words this is a called a wordle and i just pulled in the most frequently occurring uh words that came up that um are going to be bigger so the more a word is present in your submissions the bigger it gets so we can see inclusion diversity understanding education history Social, I'm sure that's coupled with social-emotional, um, supportive, cultural, inclusivity. 
So there's lots of different ideas and words that are, that are here. And so I just want to take a moment, ask a brief poll question of everyone. So based upon what you're seeing here, I'm going to throw up a poll. Um, do folks think that the administrative team should look to update the district mission and vision? And so the question of, you know, does it need a complete rewrite? It needs some slight adjustments or no, not at this time. We think we're, um, we're exactly where we should be. So just take a moment and uh, add to that poll. And this will help us to, to learn a little bit more. And can you see the um, votes as they're coming in, Mr. Clean? Yeah, I'm seeing them as they're coming. I don't know if you are. So, so just keep sharing. I'm seeing about half of us have responded. So if you haven't had a chance, just um, respond there if you're if you're able to do so. And I'm going to continue. So I mentioned earlier about what this uh, book that really the strategy in action that we've read for um, three generations of superintendents here. It's the concept of a strategy versus strategic plan. And, you know, sometimes we'll use the terms interchangeably. I know that that happens a lot. Um, but what the book helps to define a strategy as um, versus a strategic plan, a strategy is going to be more innovative. It's going to demand change and not be about the status quo. Um, there's an emphasis on an internal audience. A strategic plan is written sometimes in language that's uh, very clear. It's almost template driven. And you know anybody could pick it up without really knowing the district and just be able to very quickly understand the plan. The, the, the strategy, you need, to, you need to understand the philosophy. You need to understand what's going on in the district. And so, you know, when I say internal, I don't mean just the teachers or just the administrators. It's this school community. And so having discussions and forums and a constant conversation to understand the strategy would be that emphasis. A strategy focuses on, you know, ways of thinking and being and how we need to act and behave and what school looks and feels like as well as just what it's doing. A strategy is going to be deep and intentional. It's going to be dynamic. It's going to be uh, able to change over time. And, and we've had things in our plan, even though we're visioning something five years out, things happen and things change. And I have some examples of that in the future. But it's we're able to adjust. Every year we'll come together as an administrative team and say, what do we hit this year? What do we not hit? What do we need to adjust? Certainly something like COVID drastically changes our, our strategy as far as digital learning. And now every student in the district has a Chromebook and we have to go in a different direction next year. So it needs to be dynamic and it needs to be interdependent as well. And so a few other concepts around this strategy. It's a focus on the instructional core, as I spoke to earlier. This concept of a, a focus, so less, less objectives, less goals, not all over the place, um, really trying to focus on doing less things but doing them really well, having a coherence across our goals, across our big rocks, and that synergy across the different elements. And you'll see some of that synergy a little bit as we're, as we're working on that as well. So it should be both visionary and problem solving. So this is very important. And as we think about what those ideas are that we want to capture in something that's visionary, it can't just be something that is not related to an issue that's happening in our school. We want to say, here are some of the needs for our students, for our staff, for our schools, and how do we solve those problems? But also, how can we be visionary and how can we take the lead and do things that we think um, our students and our staff should be doing? And it needs to be both of those at the same time. And as I mentioned before, that ownership and enactment throughout the system. This isn't my plan. This is not Sean's plan. This is not the principal's plan. This is everyone's plan. And we want that ownership and buy-in in that. And this is a first step in doing that today. 
And also I want to bring in this concept of being audacious. I remember this was something that uh, Kathy Willis talked a lot about really early on about not being the status quo by really thinking beyond the box. What can we do? Let's, let's, let's put it out there. We really want to have, you know, the, the Cadillac model, right? What do we, what do we want? Let's be audacious. Let's, let's be audacious in our visioning and our thinking. We might not get there. You know, it's, it's not quite the same thing as a wish list, but let's, let's not have a ceiling to our dreams and let's put them out there and then let's see what we need to do to get there. And if there's enough support, from everyone in the school community and from the community, we can make great things happen. And we've seen that in the last 10 years for sure. So we want to be audacious as well. So the concept of the big rocks, this is the, the metaphor. If you fill your jar with gravel and sand first, so you've got a jar with pebbles, rocks, big rocks, and sand. If you fill your jar with the gravel and sand first, you won't have space for the big rocks. And so this is what often happens in systems where there's so much day-to-day -day stuff right? There's so many pebbles, there's so many little things that come up and, and issues that if your jar fills with that, you never get to get at those big rocks. And so the concept is, what are those big rocks? Let's put them in the jar first. Let's make sure we understand what the most important things are for us to achieve and make sure that our strategy is, is focused on those big rocks so that when those other pieces come up, the sand and the pebbles, it will still fill the jar, but there's still room. You've made room for your big rocks first. And that's what this process is for visioning for the future. And so our big rocks are teaching and learning, student services, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about those in a moment. So an example of how this process worked and why visioning is, is what it is. So in 2011, we had one digital learning specialist, we'll call it a DLS, for five schools. So this is a technology integration coach. We had one person who went across the five schools to help integrate technology. So our vision for 2016 was we want to have five digital learning specialists, one at each school. The, the person trying to do one for all five schools, they were never able to be enough to any one school to actually make an impact. Right? You have one person doing the best she can, getting around to five different schools, but without having that person that you know you can go to any day, are you going to attempt to, uh, to try something new? Are you going to attempt a new lesson knowing that she might not be in your building until next Tuesday? Right. Whereas having a DLS in every single building just increased capacity and increased that um, willingness that people were able to take risks and make things happen. So what did we do? We budgeted to try to have two a year. But here's the actuality. We added one in 2014, so now we had two, which is better than one. Then we were able to add three in 2015, but we had to eliminate our technicians to achieve the goal. We didn't get the funding in the budget, but we made an adjustment. Because it was in our plan, because it was something we were committed to, we said we're going to make this adjustment to keep our focus on this goal. And where are we in 2021? We have one at each elementary school, we have one K to 12, and we have two at middle, middle school, high school. And we were able to restore technicians this year with COVID funding. So that's something that we have to continue to, to fight to get into our permanent budget. But we, are, we have made this goal. It took several years, but we were able to do this and do it, and do it well and successfully. Another example is with world languages and computer science. So back in 2016, it was certainly a goal of the school committee. It was a goal of our schools to say we want to have uh, more than, than what was there in 2016. So in 2016, we had an exploratory world language at grade seven, which was uh, sort of like a quarter year elective where they, they were exposed to a few different uh, topics in French and Spanish. Then they had a required French or Spanish course in grade eight. And then there were some robotics electives along with some tech ed electives. Um, and there were significant budget challenges. You know, we wanted to see the expansion of both world language and computer science, but in some ways they almost appeared to be mutually exclusive. And so when we came up with a vision for 2021, we said we want to expand world language and computer science and have them as required courses because we want to build that foundation for world language and we also want to build a required computer science course for all students. And it took quite some time and a lot of work that that you know we all worked on together as an administrative team. Certainly Dr. O'Connell was very much involved in this and myself and superintendent and our whole team. 
But what we came up with was we added a half year course of each subject in grade six. So they have a half year of world language and a half year of robotics. And then the next year, we added the second half. So in grade seven, they now have a second uh, half year of um, robotics and a second half year of, I'm, I'm sorry, not robotics, computer science, and a second half year of world language. So that by the end of grade seven, the students will have had one full year, an additional full year of a required course that they did not have before of both computer science and world language. And we achieved that because it was in our budget, because it was in our strategic plan, and we were able to add that moving forward. So here are our strategic initiatives that fall under the teaching and learning area. So alignment of curriculum K-12, to curriculum leadership, digital learning and technology integration, and this also for this one includes infrastructure. So Wi-Fi, devices, all of that as well. Um, looking at our course offerings under teaching and learning. What kind of courses do we offer for students? Professional development in teaching and learning and the use of data to inform instruction to make decisions. Under student services, the objectives that we have, again, professional development and training, and what does that look like for student services? Digital learning and technology integration is there again. Safety and security, access to a high quality education, and then MTSS, which is our multi-tiered system of supports. So we have goals related to that as well. And then our third big rock, which is equity, diversity, inclusion. So the representation of all voices. Once again, professional development, training, foundational knowledge, digital learning and technology integration, human resources and hiring, and curriculum instruction and assessment. So these objectives is what came out of our work last summer. It was you identified these three big rocks, and we brainstormed as an administrative team what were those objectives at the high level that we felt had the most value for our district moving forward. And so I want to explain a little bit because I have had this question about equity, diversity, inclusion. What does this look like? What does that mean? And this means everything from, you know, including, how do we include all of our special education students? This also means working towards free full day kindergarten for everyone um, to provide that equity, you know, you know, cost should never be a barrier to someone who wants to have a uh, full day kindergarten. We're, we, we've worked already on this goal by reducing our uh, kindergarten fees um, in the last two years. So it's, it's less than it's been, and our goal is to continue to reduce that until we've achieved free full day kindergarten. We want to see diverse voices represented in our curriculum. We want to teach students through social emotional learning, SEL. We want to make sure that we're talking about empathy so that we can think about um, what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. And that's part of this con uh, conversation. We want to examine our hiring practice. We want to talk about what professional development and training looks like for all staff. And we want to make sure that we're listening to all student and staff voices, part of what we're doing here today for sure. But certainly we want to hear to our, we want to listen very much to our underrepresented voices and make sure we're hearing from everyone and not just um, the, the squeaky wheels, the loudest voices or the majority. We want to hear from everyone. And certainly transparency in what we're doing and how we're doing it and having conversations like the one we're having today is all a part of this. And just to be clear, potential areas of disagreement around this topic, which this is not, and I want to just take a little bit of a moment to address this, you sort of have two very different ideas here. On one end of the spectrum, you've got this concept of being anti-racist. And I think some folks have had a training and understanding of what that means. On the other extreme, you have folks arguing that the concept of being anti-racist is, is this concept of critical race theory. And both of these are being tied up in a lot of political um, ideas and agendas. And it's being regurgitated um, from the national level. We've seen how it's played out in Florida, how it's played out nationally. Um, this concept of you know equity, diversity, inclusion, which encompasses so many things that I think every one of you uh, and everyone in the community would agree upon sometimes plays out as people thinking that the schools are doing one thing or the other or not doing enough of one thing or the other when in reality i think when you look at what we're actually doing i think people would be very um 
very pleased and very happy with those things. But I think there's discussion that needs to continue. So we've heard about the 1619 curriculum for social studies, for example. This is something that says, you know, the history of the United States needs to be viewed through the lens of slavery. Just to be clear, at this time, that is not a curriculum that we're teaching in our schools. But the concept of discussing the impact of slavery on, on our, our culture and, and where we are today is certainly a conversation that, that we're aware of, and it's something that's very clearly in our frameworks. The 1776 curriculum is sort of a, a counter to 1619, which talks more about um, you know focusing more on, on the traditional um, you know, American history concepts, which again, we, we're teaching something that is very similar to what we've always been teaching with a, with a lens, obviously, to um, what's going on in the world today, as well as what's happened in history. Another example is the concept of white fragility, right? I've heard and I've, I've read in the paper this concept that, you know, the schools are teaching kids that because they're white, they're, they're, they're racist. That, that is not anything that the schools are teaching or, or being said. However, the concept of white fragility is certainly out there. There certainly are books that discuss this topic. And this is certainly something that especially our older students are aware exists. And that concept of empathy to think about, you know, I'm a white student in North Reading and almost every teacher I've ever had is also a white teacher. Very different than maybe a student of color in North Reading who hasn't had that experience of, of having a teacher who, who is from the same culture or background. And so that concept of, of empathy for thinking about other people is certainly something that we would talk about with students. And I know there's a large divide about, about this and we have to work as a community to understand it, but I think we're all committed to doing the same work with each other. Hiring practice, just another potential area of disagreement. Just to be clear, I think we can have goals around increasing hiring, but it's not as simple as just hiring you know, more diverse um, teachers or administrators. There's a whole process and there's a much bigger picture. And I want to be clear, for those that aren't aware, I'm very excited to share that we have as a multi-district um, consortium through the SEAM Collaborative with Stoneham and Melrose, Woburn, um, Reading, Linfield, we have hired an equity, diversity, diversity and inclusion coach. So this is a person who's going to work with our district um, the, uh, she will also work with multiple districts to talk about so many of these topics around equity, diversity, inclusion, including how to increase hiring opportunities um, in our communities um, of this consortium. So that's exciting. So certainly an area that you know we can be audacious and we can say we really want to change and have some some real goals, but it's it's there's a lot of work to be done, and all of this work, if to be done well, takes multiple years. One thing I just want to clarify as you're thinking ahead to visioning, we absolutely, we, we have to follow the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. So any visionary ideas that say, we're not going to teach what's in the frameworks, that's not something that we can decide at the local level. That's not something that our school committee or the superintendent or our teachers can really decide. We need to teach what's in those Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. That's that's what the Education Reform Act describes, and that's what we follow. I've heard parents on, on all different sides of the, of the thinking say that the job of the school is to teach students how to think and not what to think. And that's absolutely true. That's something that I know I would say and echo all the time, and I think our principals and teachers are, are constantly reminded of this as well. Um, the, the term indoctrination gets thrown around sometimes, and absolutely, our job is not to teach belief systems. Our job is to teach students how to think and to think critically. Um, and what we have to be careful, though, is that doesn't mean then that we are teaching them to, you know, very often the people that present this to me then say, and here's what you have to then teach them. So you have to be sure that what we're saying is we're teaching students how to think, not what to think. And they're going to hear both sides of an argument, both political ideas, um, you know, anti-racism and critical race theory, and then make some decisions on their own. And that's where the schools, parents, everyone can weigh in on that as well. Just to be clear as well, something I, I that we wouldn't be able to entertain, there's not going to be opt-outs for non-preferred topics. The only opt-out that's legal uh, for parents to opt out of involves uh, human sexuality, specifically human sexuality. And that does not involve the concepts of 
of homosexuality or gender identity, those topics, believe it or not, by fifth grade is when the concept of, of human sexuality in terms of that, you know, there are homosexuals, there are, um, you know, students of different genders, that's in the frameworks. And, and that's been in the framework since 1999, curriculum health frameworks that are, that are really out of date that need to be updated. But that's been in there for many, many years. So again, we're following those frameworks and we have those concepts that are out there. I just want that to be clear that there's not, you know, we can't have a vision that there's going to be opt-outs for topics that aren't preferred. This is part of the curriculum in a public education. And that we have to follow regulations. If there's regulations and guidance around supporting um, all students and, and, and representing uh, the needs of all students, then the schools are going to follow those regulations. So I think that we all can um, agree that those are the the rules that we are that we are governing by, and I know there's differences of opinion of people in the community, but that's certainly um, something I wanted to cl clarify. And as I have at the bottom here, all of these things need to be discussed openly and honestly. This is not the purpose of today, but we certainly can continue to have these conversations because I think that's how we begin to move forward as a community: is hear the different viewpoints on all sides and work to to what's you know best for the students of North Reading by having those conversations. All right, so we're about to jump now into the visioning protocol itself. So the steps that we're going to do, and this is where in a few moments, you know, I'll be able to open up to some clarifying questions. What we'll do is we'll have you type those questions in the chat, um, and I'll be able to answer those. And then after that, we can do some, some probing questions in the chat as well. But a clarifying question, some of you have been through this before, but I'm just going to explain it so that everyone's on the same page. A clarifying question is a simple question of fact. They clarify the dilemma and provide nuts and bolts so participants can ask good probing questions and provide useful feedback. So examples of clarifying questions would be, is this what you said? What resources were used for the project? Did I hear you say? Did I understand when you said? What criteria did you use to? What's another way you might? Did I hear you correctly when you said, did I paraphrase what you said correctly? So those are just clarifying questions. And so my thought is your clarifying questions and your probing questions would be about those objectives that I shared earlier, because what your job is, is to take those objectives and then vision out from there. So you'd want to ask possibly some clarifying questions around those. A probing question, so after we've got the clarifying questions um, answered, you then would ask some probing questions. And so this is to help me as the presenter, and I've got Sean, I've got other administrators and, and others in the call that might be able to jump on the, um, as well. But you know, why do you think this is the case? What do you think would happen if? What sort of impact do you think? How did you decide? How did you determine? How did you conclude? What is the, what is the connection between blank and blank? What if the opposite were true, then what? So this, there's some room here for some questions that we would use this forum to, to answer to prepare you to then do the next steps of visioning. So just to show you one last time the, the idea here, we have our big rocks, teaching and learning, student services, and then equity, diversity, and inclusion. We then have a theory of action that operates under those big rocks that explains if we do this, then this will happen. So that will be there for each of those big rocks. We then have the strategic objectives, which are shared with you. And from there, we're now going to be thinking about the goals and then those strategic initiatives that we do. Those are the, the steps that we take each year to achieve those goals, to achieve those objectives, to make sure that our theory of action proves true and we address those big rocks. So we're going to work through five and six is where we're going to now. So I'm going to now just switch over to show you the document itself. And this is what I'm going to share out with you in a few moments. This is a, it's a Google form that you complete using the Back to the Future protocol. And the first thing you would do is you would choose whether you are an educator in North Reading, a North Reading staff member, a North Reading student, a North Reading parent or guardian, or a community member. And I, you certainly, as it suggests here, you can work in small groups of two to three. The advantage of this is that there's you know collective thought and wisdom in every single document that comes together. So you can parents, you can do this with your children, 
Um, you know, if a few different folks can work together. I wouldn't suggest that your groups are too big. I think you're going to have a better dialogue in smaller groups of two or three, but you could complete it individually if that's the situation that you're in. But you would want to click and check all that, that apply for this as well. And then based on that, you would then choose one of the following big rocks. DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, teaching and learning, or student support. That would then bring you to the next page where you would be thinking about, am I gonna speak about this representation of voices, professional development training, digital learning, human resources hiring, curriculum instruction, the student services choices, or the teaching and learning choices. And after you select one of those, you then will be asked to project into the future and thoroughly describe what it looks like, sounds like, feels like having accomplished your goals and vision for this objective. And so you would write in your long answer, your paragraph here to describe that vision. And then you would do the next step. You'd look back from your projected future and describe how it looked when you started. Use the past tense to describe what was in place when you first envisioned your future. Speak to all aspects and include the positive and the challenges that were part of the school, community, or organization at that time. So, what we've decided to do, I'm going to now show you the form itself. So this is what you would do, and we're gonna do one together as a group, and then I will post it in the chat, and we can begin the process working in groups or individually. So the first thing I do, I'm gonna check off that, you know, I'm an educator, and I'm also here with, um, you know, I will say Mr. Clean, and he's, he's here as a parent. So I'm just gonna check that box as well. And we're gonna choose from here, we're gonna do student support services. And from student support services, I'm going to choose safety and security. Okay, and then I'm gonna click next. I'm going to go back to show you where we are. So we've chosen um, to, to look at school safety and security, but I have a couple of clarifying questions first. So Mr. Clean and, and I are going to ask um, this question. Did I hear you correctly that you said technology is no longer a big rock? And so I will answer that question. So, and you know, any of you would ask. My answer to this question would be yes, that is it. That is a shift. So for the last two strategic plans, technology was one of the big rocks. Uh, part of that was there was so much to do in technology to get our one-to-one -one initiative, to get our new building project up and running. But what we've, we've really felt that technology no longer needs to stand alone and that we should embed it in, in every single aspect. So you'll see digital learning and technology is embedded now in all three as is professional development and that creates that synergy. And by having technology no longer a big rock, we were able to increase this focus on the equity, diversity, inclusion, which we certainly, all the administrative team felt was something they were certainly hearing from all aspects of the school community as an area of focus. So another question is, what process did you use to arrive at these strategic objectives and those headings? And so my answer to that is last summer at the retreat, we brainstormed um, and we, we made a huge chart that's very uh, visual that I, I could show you. I don't have it available right now, but it's color coded by all of the different aspects of, of the plan. And we, we brainstormed all of the different ideas that could possibly be um, offshoots of these big rock topics, and then we combined and, and categorized them to try and focus and condense as much as we could do. And as I mentioned, we also realized that in each of these areas, we all were talking about technology, we all were talking about professional development, and we said, doesn't it make some sense to have those components lie in each of the three big rocks? And so we went from basically, we said, are we gonna have four big rocks or are we gonna go back to three? And that was a discussion we had, and we came to that idea that, Let's take technology and break it up into digital learning and professional development and have it under all of the big rocks. So that's the process that we use. So those are some examples of clarifying questions that then help us get to the probing questions. So here's a probing question. Why did the team decide to include professional development and digital learning supports as objectives for all three big rocks? And I think I've answered that one a little bit um, already. Here's another probing question. When you say safety and security, does that include emergency evacuations, gas leaks, the ALICE program, or could it also include something like cybersecurity? And so my answer to that would be, 
yes, it absolutely could include something like cybersecurity. So we, we do see it as all encompassing, as including safety, security, you know, responses to school uh, shooter situations, gas leaks, emergency evacuations, but something like cybersecurity absolutely could be something worth exploring through the visioning process. So now the person, after getting that feedback from me, goes back to the survey, and in the survey says, okay, for safety and security, I'm going to now vision a little bit about cybersecurity. And so we're going to just look here more closely at what this says here, but how do we, you know, projecting into the future. So in the future, in 2025 for cybersecurity, you're now imagining what it looks like. So in 2025, all students and staff will be well-versed in the terminology associated with cybersecurity, phishing, ransomware, identity theft. And this will be a part of the required curriculum for all students at all levels. Regular workshops will be offered for the entire school community to include the latest updates and modules for staff, families, and students to explore. There will be ongoing conversations with town officials, including the North Reading Police Department, to support our community-wide efforts in increasing awareness and building the knowledge base to prevent these malicious cyber attacks. At the elementary level, students will learn and demonstrate an understanding of these cybersecurity elements through their digital learning blocks. At the middle school, this curriculum will be incorporated into the computer science required courses. At the high school, the freshman seminar will include modules that are frequently updated to include the latest prevention measures related to cybersecurity. The district will measure participation in the modules for staff, students, and the community and set goals to continuously improve participation. Okay, and so then the next step is look back from your projected future and describe how it looked when you started. Use the past tense to describe what was in place when you first envisioned your future. Speak to all aspects, including the positives and challenges that were part of the school community and organization at that time. So in present, staff have completed two years of training through a grant from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Staff completed online modules to learn more about the cyber threats so that they can be proactive in avoiding phishing scams and exposing themselves to the district to potential vulnerabilities. However, only the pretest, post-test, and module one of four are required, and so there's a 40% completion rate for modules two, three, and four. Further, this initiative is very helpful to staff in their personal lives as well, and it would be very beneficial for students, families, and the community to also learn more. Several town officials also participate in the grant, but we have yet to debrief with the NRPD or town officials about the experience. Okay, so it's where do we want to be, where are we now, and then you click submit. Now, I, I want to say also that it's it's going to be challenging for some of you in the in the community, especially, you might not know where we are right now. That might be part of the issue is that you're not aware of what we're doing right now. So I would suggest that if you do have questions, you could ask me, you could ask a principal, you could ask some teachers, you can have some discussions here to see where we are now. You could also, you know, feel free, you should also complete this based on what you understand it to be. And that will be data for us as well, because if we read that and say, wow, they didn't realize that this was already in place, then we have to be very proactive to make sure that it's, it's clear to everyone that these things are already in place. So either way, it's going to be valuable information, whether you make, you know, ask some questions to inform where we are today, or you, you give us your perception of where you think we are today. Both are valuable and both um, are welcome through submissions. So then you would click submit. That then comes back to me in a Google form. And from there, I will be pulling that together with our administrative team this summer to review. Okay, so now we're going to move into the part where we begin this process together. So just a few ideas as I open this up to some questions, clarifying questions, chat. Um, we want to presume positive intent. So remember that any question that's asked, um, everyone on this call is here for one reason, and that's to do what what that person, what they believe in their heart is best for the students of North Reading Public Schools. So if anyone says anything that might come off uh, any, any way that, that is offensive or, or hurtful, please remember and assume that the person did not intend to do that. But at the same time, recognize and be very careful and cautious about what you say and how you say it. I think that's very important. I want to make sure that we recognize the diverse opinions and we work towards consensus. There's going to be um, some differing ideas and opinions, and we want to hear and value everyone, 
you know, and I, I certainly do. I take phone calls from everyone and I listen and we, we talk through all of these issues. There are many different ideas and we respect them all. As I said before, recognize that we're following Department of Education, uh, elementary and secondary education frameworks and state and federal, federal regulations. And very, very important is understanding that not every idea or goal is going to be represented in the final plan, but everything will be presented to the administration, and we certainly will, will have a discussion and be, you know, I, I hope to see most of what is shared through this process represented in some way in our final plan. There may be things that are in there that either we can't do for, you know, if we say every, you know, every teacher needs a Lamborghini by 2025, we're not going to be able to do that, right? Um, but maybe we say we, we work on, you know, some aspect of, of imp improving teacher quality or something like that. So I think we can understand that some of these visions are going to be so audacious that they're not possible, but I will be transparent and communicate and everyone should see their ideas either reflected in the plan or communicated back to you about, you know, why, why maybe we weren't able to do that or that we're already doing something and did you realize this and then we can build on that new direction. Okay, so for those that might have to leave, I just want to say where we're going to be, and then we're going to go back to do one of these together. So next steps is for all stakeholders to continue to complete the visioning statements. So this form that I'm going to share with you will stay on the call now. We have another hour, sort of a workshop hour. For those that want to do it right now, we can do some together. I would encourage you to continue to complete these on your own. You don't need to do every single one. Do the ones that are most important to you that you really value, um, but feel free to do as many as you want, and we will compile um, them and bring them to our administrative retreat in July. As I mentioned, we also have a larger retreat this year, which I'm so excited about, of our curriculum leaders in, in August. So that will be our entire leadership team, that's principals, directors, assistant principals, as well as all of our curriculum and special education leaders who are all also classroom teachers. Um, across the district in August coming together to work on this. We then will share out NRPHS 2025 as a draft and where we are at that point in the fall and continue to work on that goal alignment so we should see all of these elements reflected in our school improvement plans, in our departmental goals, and our educator and administrator goals. And certainly this will have a major impact and focus as we develop our FY23 budget moving forward. 